Welcome school board members and guest speakers from across the state. My name is Marissa Raffone. I'm your Director of Strategic Advocacy with the Washington State School Directors Association. Today you are joining us on July 27th uh, for the Mastery-Based Learning, LedgeRep Learns. This is our fourth in a series for the interim with the primary purpose of helping all of you navigate really important topics, both to you uh, and to our legislators in preparation for the legislative session ahead. Uh, and also just to give you the opportunity to share what's working for you as it relates to the topic in your own districts, and also to, to share ideas about uh, what we might need more of or less of uh, as we move forward together. So, so happy to have you all here today. Um, as you know, we are recording and I did ask folks to put their school district name and years served or whatever organization they're representing today in the chat. So you might wanna add to that or just take note of it so you know who's in the room. Uh, folks from across the state, large, small, uh, urban, rural, uh, west and east. So what a great representation of our school district. So thanks again for joining. So gonna start with our PowerPoint presentation, give you a little orientation of what to expect today. As you know, both myself and Logan Andres uh, serve you as the Washington State School Director Association Strategic Advocacy Team. I also want to acknowledge uh, Brittany Montano is here with us. Uh, she supports all of WASDA as uh, one of our administrative leads, and she is here with us today uh, taking notes in the background to be sure to capture questions that you have, uh, and then any opportunities for us to follow up with you as needed. Uh, our agenda sort of follows a consistent system. I'm going to walk you through our advocacy cycle, the positions that relate to mastery-based learning that we already have in place, and get some insights from the field from our leading legislators in this subject area, uh, Representative Santos and Senator Wellman, as well as uh, some expert presenters from State Board of Education and hear from a student. Hopefully we'll have enough time to have some dialogue between all of you about sharing some ideas. Uh, this is our advocacy cycle. I, I say this ad, na ad nauseum, but uh, always want to be sure to remind you and recognize that advocacy is a year-round effort. Uh, a lot of times we're most fully engaged during that legislative session, uh, but we're working really hard as an organization to be sure we're connecting with you school board members uh, and uh, make some links and communication with our legislators from across the state. This is when the advocacy work happens and when those important conversations help lead us into good strategy during session. Right now, what we hope you're doing most of is familiarizing yourself with our WASDA positions in preparation for General Assembly, which happens September 24th and 25th in Spokane this year, and also scheduling time with your legislators to share what's going on in your school district uh, in anticipation of the school year ahead. So those conversations can't happen too often or too early, so hope you're making time to do that now. Wanted to remind you that mastery-based learning is not a new concept for WASDA members, but it is as emerging as a greater priority. We have a permanent position already in place that recognizes the importance of accommodating individual learning uh, for to enable students to master academic skills. So that's right along the line with mastery-based learning. As you know, permanent positions are the core foundation and principles of our organization, which, which sets the foundation for the conversation we're going to have about mastery-based learning today. We also have an existing legislative position around academic rigor and equity. Again, a direct link to conversations around mastery-based learning. I, I think you're going to hear those words a lot from our presenters about uh, the fact that mastery-based learning brings forward equity as well as rigor when it comes to student learning and achievement. And then also wanted to give you a heads up that at General Assembly this year, you will be seeing a new position proposal. So this is not a position yet adopted by our membership, but you will have the opportunity to vote for it uh, and to ask questions about it, both in the interim and at General Assembly. Uh, we're hoping to move forward with a position that would allow us as your strategic advocacy team to weigh in and support during legislative session on the mastery-based learning work group recommendations. You're going to hear more about those from uh, our legislators as well as from our State Board of Education representative. Uh, so you'll get all of this and more in a handbook that will be coming out in the next several weeks, but wanted you to get a heads up that mastery-based learning will be a really strong emphasis at General Assembly coming up. 
I've mentioned their names several times, but we're really honored to have uh, the chairs of both the Early Learning and K-12 Committee on the Senate side, as well as the House Education Committee on the House side, uh, Senator Wellman and Representative Santos. Uh, give them a warm welcome. We're excited to have them here. They've been huge ambassadors and leaders for mastery-based learning, and they're going to be sharing a little bit about their passion for and hopes for the future of mastery-based learning. We're also fortunate to have Alyssa Mueller, who works with the State Board of Education as a content expert in this area. She's going to be sharing a lot of in detail information about mastery based learning uh, and be able to field some questions in case this is a new concept for all of you. And then we'll also have uh, a student perspective. Ashley Lynn is joining us today. We find it always important to hear from students directly as that's who we serve. Then we'll have an opportunity for you all to bring forward uh, how you're addressing mastery-based learning now and what you might need to be more effective. So I'm going to turn off my screen so we can see one another's faces. And before we get started with our presenters, um, Lisa Mueller did a beautiful job sharing some questions that I put in a poll. Uh, so we'd love for you to respond to the poll if you're a school board member. And uh, what we're going to do is basically do sort of a pre-assessment and a post-assessment based on the, the poll results. Um, there are no right or wrong answers. This is really just to help us understand where you're starting from and then hopefully evaluate if, if you progressed anywhere in the, in the learning uh, during our time here today. Uh, so I'm gonna launch the poll. There are three questions. Uh, we would ask that you answer the first two most specifically. If you want, want to answer the third one, you can, but it may be a little less familiar to you until after you hear from Alyssa. So the poll is launched and uh, we'll give you 30 to 45 seconds to answer the question. So go ahead and respond. Okay, so I'm just going to ask, does it not let you submit your answer? I'm, I'm having it. issues. It does not light up the submit button and I can't submit after answering the first question. I don't know if anybody else is having that issue, but I am. Maybe you have to answer all three. How do I get to the next question? Oh, <laughs> let me be smarter than my computer. Scroll <laughs> down, Michelle, scroll down. Hey, we're all learning together. We're all learning together. So... Alyssa, I'm looking at you. Are these, is this capturing what you were hoping to learn from our members today? Yeah, I'm excited to see the responses and the responses after the presentation. Great. I see that 10% of folks have voted. So I'm just going to give another 30 seconds. I know not all of you may be answering the questions because you're not a school board member and that's okay. But I bet you're going to be interested to see what we learn. We have a um, question on the profile of a graduate, um, where those list of attributes come from, because I know in our district, as we're working on it, some of the key ones that we are putting into it aren't listed. So I want to make sure this isn't some predetermined statewide thing that will then be missing some key attributes. Alyssa, do you want to go ahead and respond to that? Sure, I'm happy to. No, they are attributes that have come up in uh, work group member discussions so far with partners, but it's certainly not by any means set. So it's actually very helpful to know that. And Sandy, I'd love to hear more about what your district is doing later in the presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, so you might put another in there in the future. Great. Good. Well, it looks like we've got about 15 responses. I'm going to go ahead and close. Uh, the poll, because that gives us some good information. And I'm going to go ahead and share the results. Can you go ahead? Can you see that? Okay, up in front of you got some head nods. Great. So it looks like most folks in terms of understanding about mastery based learning, 
uh, are more, uh, about half of you who responded uh, said it's the, if it's the same as competency-based education, it is, uh, then I'm familiar with the concept but don't know much. So I'm so glad that you all are here to learn together. Uh, many of us are still growing in our understanding about it. So this is, um, this is a well-timed webinar. So happy to have that. We certainly didn't expect you to come as an expert. So happy to have you and please be sure to surface your questions. Uh, then we've got folks who are familiar with the term. Uh, we have uh, one person who has a mastery-based learning school. Uh, we also have some folks who aren't familiar with mastery-based learning at all. So this is great. Happy to have you here and uh, hopefully we'll move the needle in all of these areas for you. In terms of whether or not you've adopted a model policy around this topic, uh, as WASDA has developed them for your use, uh, we've got four who responded yes, five who responded no, and most of you who are unsure. So the great thing about this question is that it gives you the opportunity to ask the question uh, of your school board once you return back. And then um, this is a little bit of a trick question because some of you don't have familiarity, as we know, with mastery-based learning or profile of a graduate. You're going to be learning quite a bit from Alyssa about this moving forward. So this is a bit of a pre-assessment um, and uh, also because you had to answer all three questions at once. Uh, so a little bit of a poor polling design on my part, so my apologies, but still good information nonetheless. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and uh, we'll do another one of these at the end, see if there was any movement. And uh, what I'd like to do is to start uh, by giving the opportunity for Senator Wellman and Representative Santos to tell us a little bit about the work that they've led around mastery-based learning. Uh, and also tell us about where they're hoping to head in this next session and beyond. And again, just welcome both of you. Thank you for your leadership in this and so many other areas in K-12 uh, and for joining us on a, another Zoom meeting and probably a long list of Zoom meetings that you have today. So uh, go ahead and, and just jump on in. Thank you so much. Well, we just went back and forth saying, I'll go first, do you go first, do you go first? And we went back and forth being very gracious to one another. But I'm going to jump in and start. One of the things that I will share with you is, is that we understand that we're making and looking at a significant evolution uh, of our school system, um, and really in, in many ways that we can get into it you know, in depth. But really, it requires the community support. It requires everybody to be on board and, and really having this understanding. So thank you, um, Marissa, for putting this together. Um, hopefully I will be helping. I'm going to be doing my nine ESD tour very shortly, kicking off in fact next Monday. Um, I'll be in Vancouver, but, but what I'm doing this year, which hopefully will be helpful to you, is that I'm including not only a session with the ESD, with the superintendents, with some members of, of some principals, but I'm also going to be doing a parents evening. And we're putting the message out because I think that we need to give the parents the why. They're seeing changes, they're seeing different um, pathways, um, bills that talk about different pathways to, you know, to moving on to post-secondary careers and, and education. And what's happening and why is it happening? And so I think that that's going to be the focus of my talks to the parents. And uh, you, you could be uh, helpful in that as well. You know, the only const constant is change. And we have a system today that really was formulated for an industrial society where people sat in chairs in front of a teacher. And that was the way we learned. And it was based on seat time. It wasn't based on, you know, really children having um, that education that gave them the that met their needs and we've as we know you know we've we've met the needs of maybe 70 or 80 percent of our kids but um year after year we don't meet the needs of all our kids and and that's really critical and important that we we really make sure that we do that and so we're focusing on the evolution of our system partly because this isn't an industrial society. This is a digital society. This society requires many different, many different things. And certainly having had a career in technology, as I look at almost every aspect of life from you know, the fact that we're now engaged in um, this remote session where we're talking to one another. And, and in fact, we did carry on as best we could education this year because we couldn't be in our schools really reinforcing that we need to be able to um, reach one another to learn wherever and, and learning does take place 
in the home, certainly some of the most important learning, you know, initially takes place in the home and continues with all the experiences that we have. You can gain great experience as a Boy Scout or Girl Scout. You can create great experience in a school club. Very often, some of the most profound experiences in terms of who you are take place in community-based organizations or outside or in church-based organizations outside of the home because they give you these opportunities. And so what we're in the, in the process of doing is looking at um, having school become a place to learn how to make a difference, um, not confined to memorizing facts, or, but learning how to solve complex, complex problems. Um, much place-based learning experience happens outside, as we said, the school walls and the classroom will be, become a place where uh, the classroom and, and children will serve and learn where they live. Um, mentors and teachers learning, working as learning guides and help connect the students' passions so that each and every child is met where they are. Um, sometimes classes may, may more now be uh, where you have you know, a, a seventh, eighth, and ninth grader all working on the same issue because that's where they are at that particular time and place. And so we're in the process of this evolution. Uh, we're not just tweaking the traditional system. Uh, we are making some transformational and rebuilding from the core. And some of that involves the competencies that you mentioned, uh, including explicit measurable goals, setting those kinds of goals and learning objectives, empowering the students to engage in learning on their own. You know, for a long time, we've talked about, um, we have to be lifelong learners. Well, we all know that we've talked about it, but we really haven't set the, set the framework to make that happen. Most people don't read a book after they graduate from high school, unfortunately. But we are trying to empower students to engage in their own learning and to be excited about it and passionate about it because they're doing things that interested, interest them. Um, you don't necessarily have to learn reading comprehension by reading the book I give you. Maybe you are learning reading comprehension in another way by reading something that you're absolutely terribly excited about. Um, it really provides students with a great deal of agency. And I'm so pleased that we've had students on the work group that we've been, um, we've been meeting uh, with for, for uh, quite a while now. They have really given us an insight into what matters for them. And when you see students engaged in, in whether it's in a school or whether they're in an apprenticeship program or some type of program where they go out into the community to learn additional skills and additional types of learning. And they come back and, and truly say to us, you know, I never saw myself being able to be in that kind of environment. Um, I remember a trip that I took to Shinetsu and I was watching students who had been engaged in actually making um, silicone discs and one of the gals, a young, young girl who, who said to me, I never saw myself in that setting. You know, I don't think I necessarily want to come back to this company, but I never thought I could do that at all. I never thought that I could handle that kind of things. And you see that empowerment. You see that empowerment from some students at, at schools like uh, Henrietta Lacks down in Vancouver, where they're kids who have focused on careers in healthcare. And part of their, their training is going out and actually working in clinics, not just to sit there and say, oh, is this what a clinic is like, but actually having specific work that they do, skills that they come back with, that they demonstrate competency in. Um, and it's, it's systems that really focus on growing the mindset and um, some core values that all kids can learn. It's positive. I, I, I think that sometimes it's, well, it, it, they're not going to get an A or a B or whatever. Now, some of the schools that we've already got in the state that are working do give both. They will give uh, grades according to the traditional pattern that we, you know, that we have. But we know that so often what an A or a B or a C means is that at that moment in time, you got the material, you knew the answers to the questions, and you answered them that day. You may not have retained it the next day, but you got it that day and you've answered the question. And what we want to do is to have students who can demonstrate that they have learned something and, you know, kind of 
and show that building a portfolio of competencies, which have we've been told has says to either either um, people who will hire them or says to schools that they will apply to for post-secondary work. I, you know, I know th this person, I know what they love, I know what's meaningful to them, I know what they can do, and I know how to move them forward. It personalizes learning for each student's strengths, needs, and challenges. And, um, and the pacing is, is different. We don't say you have to learn this between this point and that point. You are self-pacing to the point where you, you know, learn that behavior, you learn that competency, you deal with it. And I think as we've, we've heard before, but now we're truly putting it into action, you know, when you can demonstrate um, a skill because you've built something or made something, you know, you've really internalized it. Of course, when you can teach it to somebody else, which is also the part of mastery-based education, when you can teach it to somebody else, you really can do it. And, uh, and that's my excitement in really helping our kids prepare. And I want parents to understand what we're doing is because of our evolving society, our economy. What is it based on? When I look in the fields and I see tractors, which when I was going to school required 40 people to be out there doing these various skills. And now a single autonomous vehicle is out on a farm. It is measuring the acidity of the soil. It is putting the, the, the seeds in the ground. It is doing so many other things and it's being managed completely by a, a GPS system. Um, this is a changing world. And, and uh, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day about Japanese toilets. I mean, I, I, it, it, the controls on that are extraordinary. Um, we are going to be, we are in a world, not going to be, we today are in a world of constantly evolving um, training and retraining, regardless of what position that you're in. You've already seen that, um, I think, just, just uh, the um, school director's position of the kinds of things that you've had to deal with with technology because of COVID, the changing, you know, the changing school environment where broadband is so important, making sure that kids have connectivity in their homes. Now they have devices. How are we going to utilize those to broaden our world and get our kids ready for the next stage in our lives? And that's really our job. Um, I don't say my job or, or Senator uh, Representative Santos's job. That's all of our job is to make sure that our kids come through the system prepared for the economy, prepared to thrive in the economy in which they will be living. So that hopefully I didn't take too much time and, um, but I'm really excited about this. And I think that as a state, uh, uh, I know that we're, we're in the forefront of, of moving in that direction with some of the things that we have, you know, put into place with with multiple pathways forward, with acknowledging that there are multiple pathways forward. And we're not done there. I mean, think of all the things that kids may want to be today. We want to be able to, uh, to tailor a, a system that supports them in moving forward. Representative Santos, would you like to pick up now? Well, thank you so very much, Senator Wellman. And again, um, I will apologize in advance if you hear buzzing in the background, that's the guy doing something with my yard. Um, Senator Wellman has uh, really, I think, laid out um, sort of the big picture of why are we taking up Mastery Base? And I, I do want to just uh, reiterate and reemphasize uh, a couple of her points. Um, it's, it's not a, a piece of information that is lost on all of you, I'm sure, that uh, we are still working within the confines of a school system that was created for a 19th century society and a 19th century economy. And while the content may have changed a little bit, for the most part, the way it is structured is very similar. Well, what is part of the problem there? One is it's based on a factory assembly line model, which makes sure that everyone comes out exactly the same, uh, or at least that's 
what we've based all of our desired outcomes on. Um, but we forget that that 19th century system was intended to uh, educate people to the eighth grade. That was the system that my grandmother was educated in. And it was very common for people to conclude their formal education in the eighth grade. Well, after that, sometime in the 20th century, we said, well, that's not quite good enough. We have to push it to the 12th grade. Uh, but even so, I would ask all of you to remember that uh, in the early days, common schools included our technical and community colleges. That was part of our common school system. So today, though, we have kept the K through 12 uh, structure. We've sent uh, community and technical colleges to higher education. So really the 12th grade is the space in which we're working. Um, we are uh, staying within the agrarian school calendar um, and uh, we are increasing the sophistication of the content to produce uh, people to enter into an age of space and artificial intelligence. And what is required, therefore, is if we've not changed the structure, is that we've actually narrowed the opportunities for students to actually deeply learn this content, which is arguably much more complex and requiring additional time. So instead of the hour, we're now reduced to 50 minutes for complex subjects that are necessary to build up the scaffolding for students to get to the next level. Again, I've said nothing that you don't already know. What I would like to, um, however, uh, share is um, this idea of, so what do we want um, from our education system? Well, I'm gonna share with you what I want. Um, and I, um, will begin by saying my wants are determined by two things. One, I am a product of the school system in which I currently represent, not Renton, because I did see the Renton School Director on here, but uh, Seattle Public Schools. But more important, I am the daughter of an educator who taught in the Seattle Public Schools as a um, special education teacher. Um, that was back in the day, and some of you might remember this, when mainstreaming was considered the avant-garde uh, initiative for, for special education. We are no longer going to institutionalize our special ed students. We're going to bring them into the mainstream so that they can see students who are um, non-special ed, uh, but we still kept them in segregated classrooms, by the way, but that was the avant-garde initiative. And as the daughter of a teacher, if any of you are children of teachers, um, you might recognize this experience, or maybe you are a parent and you do this to your own child. Don't get me wrong, it's fine. I turned out okay for the most part. Um, and that is, I was often called on to be the teacher's helper, uh, whether it was before the academic year began or after the academic year concluded, the infamous setting up the room or packing up the room, but I also got to go on a lot of field trips and just be with my mom as she was teaching her kids because I wasn't one of her kids. Of course, her students were her kids. These are children who went to school in wheelchairs, uh, on gurneys. They had uh, coloscopy bags. They were ages from eight to 16, but they all were um, tested at the second grade level. And what I learned from my mother, and especially after my mother passed away 20 something years ago, and we received all kinds of wonderful notes from the students or their students' families, is this little ditty that I patterned off an old NPR program, uh, which some of you might recall was called um, This I Believe. And so this is what I believe. I believe that every ch child has aspirations and ambitions, but they're not the same. And yet our school system expects the same of them. I believe that every child has unique aptitudes and abilities, 
but they are not all the same. And yet our school systems measure on a universality of aptitudes and abilities. And all students, I believe, have come to school with assets and advantages that are not the same. And yet we treat every student as if they come to us having all the same assets and advantages. That I believe, along with our 19th century system has created all kinds of perversities that today as a policymaker, I and Senator Wellman and other legislators have to try and mitigate. And what we're doing with mastery-based learning, I think, is transforming the system so that we're not trying to mitigate perversity. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one is um, the issue of uh, special education. Now, some of you may be engaged in a policy of inclusion, uh, but not everyone. Um, and the fact of the matter is whether you are a special education student or not, if your learning level is X, why do you then also have to be put in a classroom where um, if you're a gen ed student in a gen and mainstream uh, classroom or inclusive classroom, why do they have to be age-based? Why can't they be based on similar competencies? And before anyone says, no, that can't be done, we've always been age-based cohorts. I will tell you that just across the border in Idaho, they have mastery-based cohorts. Gets a little messy when they change at the bell time, but all students don't have any confusion. They know where they're going and why they're going to a classroom because little Johnny may be an excellent reader. So he's going in with the, he's in the second grade, but he may be going in with the fourth grade readers because that's his reading level. And he's challenged that way. But um, on the other hand, you might have a sixth grade Susie who's also reporting to that same classroom. We adults are the ones who have made a big deal about what age you are in and whether or not that's associated with the appropriate grade. There's another um, issue uh, as well, and that is uh, the issue of whether or not we are engaging and embracing all of the wisdom and talents and attributes and services our community can bring to bear in our schools. Because each and every one of these children is associated with some kind of household. Now, maybe it's not their natal family household. I will acknowledge that. But there is a network of adults that is helping to support that child. And we as a school system need to stop creating this artificial divide that is the same artificial divide between work and home that we see between school and home and have a much more porous uh, experience for our students. Because frankly, schools can't be expected to do it all. There's not enough money for schools to be able to do it all, but can we do it with the support of our communities? I think we can do a much better job. Now, I'm going to just uh, repeat what you've heard from um, Senator Wellman. I'm gonna say it slightly differently. And then I wanna just end up with a couple of quotes because I think really the engagement and dialogue is where we can get more richness in this. Um, the five characteristics that we embodied in legislation that define mastery-based learning, I'd like to just uh, share with you because I would think uh, that most of you would say, yes, that is what we want out of our education system. At least I hope this is what you would say. And the reason that we can't do it is because, again, we find ourselves facing all of these barriers that are of long standing. So we define mastery-based learning as uh, a system whereby students advance upon demonstrated mastery of content, that the competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives that help empower students, that assessments are meaningful, not just a checkbox, and that they're a positive learning experience for the students 
that students receive rapid differentiated support based on their individual learning needs. And finally, that learning outcomes emphasize competencies that include application and creation of knowledge, along with the development of important skills and dispositions. So I said I was going to conclude with uh, a couple of quotes. Um, these are quotes that um, one, I think you've probably all heard before. The other, I think maybe, maybe you've all heard before, but they're informed by a couple of things. I happen to represent a district in which one of the largest uh, businesses is a heavy manufacturing business that is operated by Lighthouse for the Blind. When I've gone on tour there, you will see deaf blind people operating huge industrial sized saws, doing metal work. They're doing things with machines that as a sighted, able-bodied person, I would not want to be 10 feet within proximity of that machine. And yet these adults are engaged in meaningful, relevant work that feeds their own sense of self-worth and ability to sustain themselves. Again, as the daughter of a special education teacher, that is very meaningful for me because there are too many children, whether they're special ed children or children of color, children of poverty, children whose first language is not English, that we as a system, not we as people, but we as a system say, they're too hard to teach. They can't teach, we can't, they can't be taught. And yet every one of those children who is not taught, basic skills is not going to be able to be that independent, self-sufficient uh, individual that we say in our goal of basic education, we are creating. And if they're not that, then they're going to be a um, burden to society and they will not uh, have that sense of self-worth. So here are the two ideas. One that I'm confident every single one of you have heard uh, is um, what uh, Senator Wellman indicated as um, sort of her measure of deep learning. And it is the old proverb that if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for his lifetime. And that I think is really what we are trying to accomplish, teaching people how to fish. And so that leads me then to what is the content of a 21st century uh, product. And for this, I call in uh, the spirit of Jean Piaget, who many of you know um, uh, as an educator and many of you might, might recognize as a guru, if you will, of early education. And one of the things that he said, and I'm going to amend it so that it's more inclusive, uh, is that the purpose of education is to create people who are capable of doing new things not simply repeating what other generations have done, but people who are uh, creative inventors and discoverers. And I challenge us all to think about what system is going to lead us not only to the end of the 21st century, but into future centuries, if we hold on to a factory-based assembly line form of education. So with that, I know you want to actually hear more in depth what we're doing. And for that, I think we have to call on Alyssa and Randy. Am I right, Marissa? That's so true. Uh, before we pass it to them, I again want to thank uh, Senator Wellman and Representative Santos 
uh, for your perspective. Uh, your passion is clear. Uh, we have made progress in the area of mastery-based learning, and it is also obvious that we will be continuing this conversation, uh, both because your leadership and because it's necessary. So uh, the information that Alyssa will provide will help equip us with some of the additional tools we need to participate in that advocacy work. Uh, in the interest of time, we won't be able to field questions live, uh, but um, Representative Santos, Senator Wellman, you are welcome to stay and listen in. We've got another 45 minutes during which time Alyssa will be presenting and then uh, Ashley Lynn, our student voice, uh, will be uh, bringing us home. So you're welcome to stay the whole time. We're, we're also recording. If any of you have questions for any of the presenters, please type it in the chat. Uh, presenters can either answer in the chat or we'll follow up with the presenters and make sure that their responses come out in this week's interim, which we'll release on Friday. So with that, I'm going to pass it to uh, Alyssa, who's going to dive deeper. Thank you, Marissa. And I believe you're screen sharing for me. Is that correct? All right. Fantastic. So good afternoon, Alyssa Muller. I work for the State Board of Education, as Marissa has already said. Today, I am going to provide an overview of the mastery-based learning work that's happening in the state, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation, time permitting. I also want to hear from you about what you'd like to see included in the state profile of a graduate that the mastery-based learning work group is currently developing. All right, Marissa, I think you can go to the next slide for me. Uh, so the work group has four legislative members, including Representative Santos and Senator Wellman, who you just heard from, is that, and as you can see, have both been huge champions of mastery-based learning. Additionally, there are members representing the various levels of our education system, including state-level organization representatives from the EOGOAC, the State Board of Education, OSDI, the Professional Educator Standards Board, the Washington Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, WASAC, as well as a local school board member, superintendent, principal, teacher, counselor, and most importantly, our amazing student member, Ashley, who you'll hear from a little bit later. Next slide. School looks very different today than it did when the Mastery-Based Learning Workgroup began our journey two years ago due to the coronavirus and the reckoning our country has been undergoing as we grapple with our historical and present day structural racism. The workgroup truly believes that Mastery-Based Learning is the way to transform our education system to close both the opportunity gap and the resulting achievement gap. And the work group believes, as you've heard from both of our legislative members, that demonstrated mastery of content, not seat time, should be the measure by which students are seen as ready to progress in their learning journey. Mastery-based learning also erases the need for gifted or remedial courses because it recognizes that each student's learning happens differently for each subject while simultaneously valuing the knowledge and skills that students bring with them from their diverse cultures and their learning that has occurred outside of the classroom. And the work group's vision for mastery-based learning, students will enjoy relevancy, engagement, and choice in their learning. Because of this, mastery-based learning facilitates students' transitions to careers and prepares all students for the workforce of the future by allowing them to experience ownership over their own learning process. Next slide. Various programs already exist in Washington that align well with the goals of mastery-based learning such as accelerated learning opportunities with Running Start, project-based learning experiences, career and technical education, and learning experiences that happen outside of the classroom. Mastery-based learning values these learning experiences that take place away from the school building and can accommodate multiple ways to demonstrate student learning through cultural experiences like a tribal canoe journey, work-based learning experiences like mock interviews and job site tours and project-based learning where students are solving real problems in the community. Next slide. Because of the coronavirus and the resulting school building disruptions, the work group encouraged the State Board of Education to adopt a rule regarding policies that could be helpful to school districts immediately. So last September, the State Board of Education adopted rule that outlines the process for granting students mastery-based credit. The rules have several components. They outline what must be included in a district's policy around mastery-based credit, including an equity provision, 
that requires districts to review disaggregated student data to see which particular groups of students are receiving mastery-based credit. And if the district finds disproportionality among student groups, the district must take appropriate action to ensure equitable access to mastery-based credit opportunities. The rules also outline broad categories for student demonstration of proficiency that districts could consider making available to their students such as local assessment methods like a portfolio or student presentation or a hands-on demonstration of knowledge and skills, as well as how to award credit for learning experiences conducted outside of the school building. As we mentioned earlier, WASDA also has had a model policy and procedure for mastery credit in world language for more than a decade. But in response to coronavirus, the state board and WASDA partnered together to create such a model policies for mastery-based credit and all subjects that have state learning standards. Next slide. The work group's 2020 report recommendations laid the foundation for the next stage of work that is happening this year. The work group um, over the last couple of years focused primarily on barriers at the high school level because they are more inherently ingrained because of the structure of the credit graduation requirements and possible transcript issues. And in response to some of these barriers, one of the work group's recommendations is to continue engaging with higher education during their work this year to make sure higher education understands the change that we're making in our K-12. Several other possible barriers addressed in the report included the need to review the state's accountability and funding system for alignment with mastery-based learning. We have heard from several districts that the state's current funding model is a disincentive for mastery-based learning. And due to that, the Innovative Learning Pilot Program was created by the 2020 legislature to address funding challenges faced by early adopter schools currently operating under a State Board of Education waiver from the credit-based graduation requirements. The work group also committed to continuing to engage with education partners and families regarding barriers faced in the transition to mastery-based learning. And so the work group is doing listening sessions this summer to hear from schools, families, and community members about their hopes for the next phase of the work. And I'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Will you go back for me, Marissa? Thank you. Sorry, I'm covering a lot on this slide. Um, the work group was also given a charge around how to use the high school and beyond plan to support mastery based learning and several schools were featured in the 2020 report that do a fantastic job already of using the students career goals as laid out in their high school and beyond plan to guide the students learning experiences in the classroom. The work group believes that the high school and beyond plan is the map to get a student from where they are now to where they want to be both academically and in life. The work group made several recommendations to address their charge around improvements in the high school and beyond plan as an essential tool for mastery-based learning, including ensuring that the legislature um, funds counselors at a level in line with the American School Counselor Association ratio to support the high school and beyond process in a more robust way. Uh, the work group has also articulated that professional development is needed not just for classroom educators, but educators at all levels of our system to support the high school and beyond plan process and mastery based learning. When teachers are able to see each student's individual learning goals articulated in their individual high school and beyond plan, then they can tailor their instruction to become more relevant and responsive to their particular students interests. For this to take place, professional learning is needed for teaching staff and other educators on both mastery-based learning and the high school and beyond plan. Additionally, the work group made a recommendation um, to continue into this year to develop the state profile of a graduate and to make any other recommendations necessary to support the implementation of mastery-based learning. The profile of your graduate idea builds on models from other states and is a promise to students and to the community that regardless of a student's grades or the particular pathway completed, all students will develop the self-agency and critical thinking skills across a variety of disciplines that will help them problem solve and succeed after high school. The legislature did extend the work group with this charge to develop the profile of a graduate, which is why the work group is meeting over the course of this year. Um, Washington's state policy framework for a mastery-based learning diploma is not creating a separate high school diploma. I wanna be clear about that. Whether students earn a diploma through meeting the current credit graduation requirement 
or through a master-based learning system, the student will meet the same state and local learning standards. In essence, the vision would be a system where students have multiple opportunities to demonstrate what they know and can do. And finally, the work group heard very clearly from schools already implementing mastery-based learning, both in our state and across the nation, that a support structure must be in place to allow for educator professional learning and collaboration. Based on this recommendation, the legislature provided funding to the State Board of Education for mastery-based learning demonstration sites. Next slide. The State Board will be running a grant application process this fall, but we did share a preview announcement about this opportunity um, with superintendents and principals on July 1st. This grant project will establish a statewide infrastructure to provide needed professional learning policy and communication support um, to districts and schools to implement mastery-based learning. Grant awardees will participate in the Mastery-Based Learning Collaborative to share effective practices for implementation, and the project will also document the key steps that a state, districts, and schools must take to transition to mastery-based learning successfully to inform future policy development. Next slide. One more time for me. Thank you. The work group has been charged by the legislature this year to develop a profile of a graduate by December of 2021, describing the cross-disciplinary skills, also known as social emotional skills or 21st century skills that the student needs to develop by the time they graduate from high school to be successful in their next steps in life, whatever those might be. You can think of a profile of a graduate as a guiding vision for the education system and as a way of enabling educators to focus on all of the important skills in the classroom we want our students to learn beyond just the specific academic content. Skills like critical thinking and problem solving and how to work well in a team. These skills are important regardless of if you're in a math class or a social studies class or regardless of what a student chooses to do in life after high school. The work group has begun consulting with students and families of color, as well as representatives of higher education, business, and labor. The work group is continuing to do outreach statewide and will be hosting listening sessions to get input to inform the development of the profile over the next months, as well as we'll be releasing a statewide survey to um, provide other feedback opportunities uh, later this week. And then as a preview of work coming next year, in the same bill that extended the work group to develop the profile of a graduate, once the profile has been the, developed, the state board has been charged to submit recommendations to the legislature to align graduation requirements with the profile of a graduate by December of 2020. Next slide. We have some references in state law already that guide what our students should know and be able to do by the time they graduate from high school. In our basic education law, it states that students will have the opportunity to become responsible and respectful global citizens, to contribute to their economic well being and that of their families and communities, and to explore and understand different perspectives and enjoy productive and satisfying lives. Additionally, school districts are charged with providing opportunities for every student to develop the knowledge and skills essential to communicate successfully, know and apply knowledge across the areas think analytically and creatively and solve problems. Existing laws will of course be taken into account when developing the profile, but the work group hopes that the profile of a graduate at a high level will serve as the overarching vision for the education system moving forward and one that schools, families, and communities will embrace because they will have helped develop it. Next slide. The Aurora Institute is an organization that works to advance student-centered innovative K-12 education systems um, to create equitable and just outcomes for all. Recently, the Aurora Institute published a policy brief in which they identified the top issues to address in state policy for transforming our K-12 education system. The number one recommendation calls for defining student success through a profile of a graduate to create a vision to modernize and redefine more holistic graduation requirements based on what students need to know and be able to do for future success. So I wanted to show a couple examples of profiles of a graduate so that you can get a sense of what other districts and state have created. Um, the district in Washington that I've seen that has one of the most developed implementation of a profile of a graduate is, in, is the Snoqualmie Valley. 
And like most districts, their purpose for developing their portrait of a graduate is that in addition to a rigorous academic foundation and strong subject mastery that they aspire to help all students gain, they're using their portrait of a graduate to focus the district's attention on helping students develop the personal skills and attributes a student needs to be successful post high school. They developed it over the course of five months back in 2019 with several methods of hearing from the community um, along the way. And they have developed a three-year plan to implement the portrait throughout the district and its curriculum and have also begun designing a corresponding portrait of an educator. Next slide. In South Carolina, conversations around new definitions of student success actually began at the local level, and their profile of a graduate was adopted in 2013. A few years later, they developed their competencies of the profile you see on screen to make the profile actionable in all schools and classrooms around the state. Each competency or interdisciplinary skill has rubrics with seven levels that track student growth and readiness for post-secondary success and their state's Department of Education provides ongoing professional learning opportunities around the profile of a graduate and associated competencies, including a teacher leader fellows network to lead implementation in their own communities. Next slide. These are some of the attributes that I see listed the most in graduate profiles from around the country. You'll see that the four C's often show up as communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking as well as its global citizen, which is, of course, part of our state's basic education law. I would also note that some profiles, like the Utah State Profile, specifically include both academic skills as well as social and emotional skills. So at this point, I want to go ahead and transition into questions and answers, um, either general questions about the presentation or um, most importantly, I wanna hear from you about what you would wanna see in Washington's profile of a graduate to inform the work group's thinking. Thanks, Alyssa. And I would ask that if you have a response to any one of these questions, and maybe Alyssa, you could, you could go through them, that you type comment, uh, or if you have a question that you'd like to ask Alyssa, go ahead and type that into the chat. I'll moderate the chat just to prevent us from talking over one another since we've got uh, around 25 people here. So uh, looks like uh, we've got a question from Dave Larson out of Tuckwilla. Uh, how is master-based learning being enabled or incentivized in elementary schools? That's a great question, Dave, and it's one that unfortunately I don't have a very satisfying answer to um, because a lot of the state board's work is around high school graduation requirements. We hear the least from elementary schools, um, so I'm certain that some elementary schools are doing mastery-based learning, but I don't know of any off the top of my head, so that's certainly a knowledge gap that we have. Um, when I have talked to elementary school teachers, not that are doing mastery-based learning per se at a full implementation level, but simply just talking about the definition and what we hope to see in a mastery-based learning school. I mean, of course, they, I think because of the structure where an elementary teacher is generally teaching all subjects, they can do it in a way that is perhaps easier than a high school teacher teaching science, you know, for instance. But again, I, I don't know a lot about where mastery-based learning is happening in elementary school right now. So uh, I, I just responded um, to that and said, if, if you know, if you're in the audience and know of any elementary schools who are doing a good job, uh, please just type elementary in the chat and we'll either call on you or follow up with you about that. Would love to learn from the experiences out in the field. Uh, Sandy Hayes, uh, North Shore School District uh, has a comment. Uh, Marissa, I hate to interrupt, but Senator Wellman had her hand up. I didn't know if she wanted gosh. to respond to Dave's question. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand up, Senator Wellman. Go ahead. Oh, that's fine. I thought it might be helpful. Um, no, I don't either, although there are a number of, of mastery-based um, project-oriented things. We certainly see that, and I'm very excited about First Ro Washington Robotics, for instance. It's a club that starts, and many of the uh, clubs that are focused on computer science, et cetera, start in elementary school. And so where kids get involved, whether it's with Legos or with Minecraft, or with any one of the various games, we see a lot of mastery-based type competencies developed in elementary schools, although it's not been a formal program. 
Um, this is not a one and done. This is an evolution and it, it is taking place over a period of time. So where it's been very successful um, in Camas, for instance, where when they had the opportunity or need for a new high school, they were able to um, create a high school that they determined would be a mastery-based focused high school. And we've heard a lot about from the students there, the kinds of projects that they got involved with even during COVID where uh, immediately they did 3D printing of masks and turned out thousands of masks for the community. So it was a civics project. It was a creative project. It was a collaborative um, uh, you know, exercise, et cetera, which is the kind of thing that we want to see. And we have found that the, the easiest way is where there is a need in communities, as in my district in Gibson Eck um, in Issaquah, where when they were going to develop a new high school, they make the determination that that school would be um, one that was mastery based, um, a, a magnet school. We've seen those types of things develop. And so that's how it's happening. Um, and meanwhile, as we do the back end, and put in place some of the legislative things that need to be in place to facilitate these multiple pathways uh, happening. And as I've said, where I, I mentioned uh, Henrietta Lacks, which is a, you know, a purpose-driven school. Uh, students apply to be there because they want to develop a career in, um, in the, the um, medical field in the health field. Um, we've also have Asia Aviation High School. We have um, many different schools of that nature uh, around the state. So it's happening slowly and it's working you know, its way down as we put in place the things that are needed to facilitate that happening. And sometimes it's just changing the statutes which say, this is what we give credit for, which is you're in the seat for X number of hours and that's how we give credit for that student as opposed to that student being out on a job or that student being spent part-time in a skill center, et cetera. So I think that that's really an important thing for us to continue to do. Thank you, Senator Wellman, that's helpful. Uh, Sandy, did you wanna go ahead and um, make your comment live? Oh, I, I feel like I was pretty succinct, but just um, I noticed that in the Whole, that creativity and that idea of being a lifelong learner, learn, learning mindset um, were, were missing, uh, but they were in the Snoqualmie Valley uh, list. And those are two big things that are definitely being brought up in my district. So, yeah. Good points. Thank you. I see Alyssa shaking her head. Um, so Alyssa, I'm gonna take, um, a nudge from you. There's about 10 minutes left before I'd like to pivot to Ashley. So we've got uh, time for student voice. <laughs> uh, appreciate you being here, Ashley. Uh, we have one time to respond to maybe one more question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know we need to go back to your presentation. You had a couple more slides left. Is that correct? They'll be really fast. They're mostly FYI slides. Okay, great. Uh, so it looks like uh, Lisa Rivera Smith out of Seattle Public Schools had a question about. Uh, uh, does it require, does MBL require a new grading system? Um, it depends, <laughs> which is nobody's favorite answer. Um, but I say that because yes, I think a new grading system would certainly be helpful in transitioning to mastery-based learning. And a lot of districts will make this all at once, right? They will implement mastery-based learning and a grading system um, at the same time. But I've also seen districts who um, don't wanna freak out parents Right. And they're like, uh, you know, maybe we'll implement mastery based learning. We'll start on this journey and we'll get to the grading down the line. Right. Then we'll make the change to, you know, um, approaching expectations, meeting expectations, exceeding expectations or any other of the similar standards based grading um, system. So I don't I don't think you have to do it at the same time, but it could be helpful. I think down the line, eventually, yes, it would you would want to have a a more mastery based aligned grading system. Is that helpful? To, am I answering your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, and, and that's so I kind of suspected, but I wanted to see if there was, and it would be great to see some um, model like grading policies that like you said, the approaching and leading kind of, because um, we, you know, and that is, that's, that's been a discussion too in our district just about our grading system in general, even without, you know, a master-based learning, um, leading, I get away from 
the you know the field when that is not you know clearly reflecting students learning and achievements so thank you yeah well, and um, I should have probably said this during the presentation, but if at any point you have questions like that, that maybe you don't have time to do all your own research about things like that, feel free to reach out to me. My email is on the State Board website and I can put it in chat. I'm happy to help with resources that I'm aware of that exist or just answer questions at any time. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Cassandra Sage has a question. Um, uh, for state board, have you looked into how AVID programs are run? She had, uh, Cassandra, did you want to elaborate on that question at all? No, I'm just thinking about the critical thinking skills that the kids develop and meant as a mentor in the classroom, how, uh, how I wish all kids had that, like the entire school would develop those critical thinking skills in each class, no matter what the subject was and wondered if the state board has looked at that. You know, not extensively. Of course, I'm aware of the program and know, you know, this much about it, probably enough to be dangerous, um, but no, not in conjunction to mastery-based learning specifically. So that's a good reminder for me to do some more research. Thank you. Good thinking, Cassandra. Thank you. Uh, looks like that clears the questions from our audience, our members in the chat. I also typed in there the questions, Alyssa, that you had in your presentation. Uh, what I'll do is also include these in our uh, end of week sort of overview of this presentation. And that publication actually goes out to 750 of our members. And so uh, perhaps I can include your email address in that in case folks want to respond to you directly, and that'll give our members here a little more time to think through how they might want to respond. That would be great. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead uh, and pop up the remaining slides for you, Alyssa, and then right around 1.15, I'd love to invite Ashley Lynn uh, to give her perspective on uh, the importance of mastery-based learning from the student experience, and also maybe even Ashley share a little bit about your experience on the work group as well. So with that, I'm going to bring up your slide deck again. All right, um, so this is really just a reminder and gives you a link um, where you can find all of the registration links for our profile of a graduate listening sessions. Um, we're hosting them over the next few weeks, and I would really love if you would consider sharing um, the listening session information with your um, district and your district's families. Uh, the first one is on Thursday, and then we have them um, over the next few weeks. Um, so just a link that um, that's included in the slide deck, and I'll pop it into chat here in just a minute as well. And the next slide. So Marissa has this PowerPoint, obviously, since she's screen sharing, but I just wanted to call out to this slide. This includes references to all of the various resources I've talked about today. Um, so just wanted to give those to you so you didn't have to go searching through State Board website. So at this point, I will just wrap up and say, please do reach out anytime you have questions or just want to talk more about mastery-based learning. I will turn it over to Ashley, who will be much more interesting than my presentation, I promise. <laughs> Ashley, thanks again for joining. Go ahead and uh, hop on in. Just share share your perspectives about what you've heard today and what you think about mastery-based learning and uh, any insights you'd want your school board members to know. Uh, these are school board members who make decisions on behalf of their own school districts and uh, it's critical they hear from students. So thanks for being with us. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. Um, it's so great to see here. I mean, to be here and to see everyone. Um, my name is Ashley Lynn. I uh, just graduated from Union High School in Camas, Washington. Um, yeah, like, I mean, I think a lot of people here, you, you know, have heard many reasons about why mastery based learning is just incredibly important. Um, I, like, I think I want to share kind of two things I hear a lot from, um, from, you know, from my peers um, about what they want out of school. Um, I think the first one is that people want school to be healing. Um, 
you know, students want school to be places where we can show up um, as our full and authentic selves, right? And mastery-based learning is how we personalize student learning and um, and how we show them that we really value their like their experiences both in the classroom but also in their families and their communities, um, and that we like care about who they are. And so uh, and so it's cool that mastery-based learning can do that. Um, and the second thing I feel a lot from kind of students is we want school to prepare us for the future. Um, you know, like, and I think it's really funny how we sometimes think that preparing kids, you know, for college and career means like making sure they can pass like a standardized test, right? But when you talk to young people, like we want to know things like how to do our taxes and like how to buy apartments and like how to build our credit score. We like want to be able to do real things in our community, and master based learning gives us a pathway to practice taking action. Um, you know, to practice taking responsibility, to really discover and hone our gifts, and um, and be of service to our community. Um, and so, I just think that is very cool. That when you go talk to you know students and ask them, what do you want out of school? Um, how like how can we support you best? So like so many of the responses you hear. Are, um, are aligned to master based learning principles. And, um, and I just you know, think it's a great place to start in terms of actually helping our students um, kind of leave high school with, with a plan that makes sense for them. Um, but I guess I would also say, you know, like, don't just take my word for it, um, actually engage students in the process. Um, you'd be really surprised uh, by how much insight young people have to contribute right um we spend most of our time in the classroom and we have a lot of opinions on um, on how we want to learn how we learn best and we know kind of what support we need um and and it's really powerful to um to kind of engage young people in that process so i uh, like i I remember one of the coolest interactions I had with like a school board was like, um, I think my school board did this like breakfast with the board thing where like they kind of brought together groups of students at like different high schools and like just had like had space to interact. And like, I think creating more of those spaces um, for for students to share their to share their perspectives and to ask students questions um, is a great place to start. Yeah, like I, um, I'm happy to like kind of answer any questions people have, or um, or just talk about whatever feels meaningful. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Um, I'm happy to uh, field any questions in the chat. Uh, I have a I have a question for you. Um, I heard you say uh, that it's important and obviously to engage student voices, ask students directly what they should do. I'm wondering if you had an experience during, during your K-12 experience, including high school, did you engage in conversations with any school board members that you can recall that helped lead to positive outcomes as it related to mastery-based learning or your learning experience that you'd like to share um, so that they might be replicated by other school districts? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I I think part of the challenge is that school board members and students don't often end up in the same spaces, right? Like when you're not taking up the same spaces, when you're not, um, you know, in proximity to each other, it's kind of hard to have conversations if you don't even like see other people. And so I think one of the first steps to creating more of these opportunities is just to create more spaces and time where like, People are brought together. Um, I think throughout my K-12 experience, I didn't necessarily have a lot of um, kind of like opportunities to um, to be in the same spaces as school board members. Um, but but there were kind of certain kind of like events that were hosted, kind of like breakfast with the board, where I was able to um, kind of just just to share my perspective on. Um, you know, on how I wanted school to look like and um, and kind of my kind of vision for that. Um, but I think there is, I think there's a lot of co-creation and co-ideation that can be done around like, what are some ways to bring people together and then actually, um, 
create like communication channels for for young people to know like, this is the impact that like what I contributed had right so it's like sometimes we say things but like and like people hear them but no action is taken and so how do you create kind of that feedback loop where um where people on both sides know kind of like what like what the information is but then also what um what action is being taken based on that I hope that answers your question yeah did I hear you say that um your school uh your district hosted a breakfast between school board members and some students. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah. Was that a one time a year event that was consistent? It was a, a did it have a specific purpose that you remember? Um, they, it was they, like two years ago. I like I don't think it's like a yearly event, but I remember they like kind of did a tour of a bunch of high schools um, and yeah, and just had conversations. I think the point of that was just to kind of grassroots like surface students ideas on um, on how to improve school community um but you know they like they can be oriented around anything right and um and bring students together in like books groups or um yeah can like can be really powerful and like i guess i like i i also think a lot about like kind of like School board meetings and how like a lot of students just like don't know like those exist or, like those are a thing um but then also like challenges with like certain students can't make it to school board meetings they require transportation like uh time and so it's and so it's all also kind of like a matter of equity and how and how do we service um kind of perspectives from students who um like who might not be able to get to the school board meetings right and um, and so there's like a whole another kind of set of challenges associated with that. Thanks, Ashley. Do you know if your district had student reps? Does Camus have student reps currently on the school board? No, I uh, I'm in the Evergreen school district. And we oh, I'm sorry, Evergreen. Yeah, I'll make the correction on my slide deck. My apologies. Um, we did have a follow up question uh, from Diane out of Kenwick. Um, in the invitation uh, to the breakfast, th were all students invited or was it a group of students who had a particular role in the school district, do you recall? No, it was a group of students. I'm not sure what the selection process was, um, but yeah, it was um, it was a group of students, probably, and like pro probably just students who were involved in like school leadership and like ASD and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I like. I definitely think there's like. I think when it comes to student voice, we hear from a lot of the same people all the time, mm -hmm. um, and so there's there's a really big need to um, to really kind of widen and like broaden kind of the communities of students who are reaching. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, looks like Brian Giannini Upton out of Mercer Island has a comment. Brian? Thank you. And Ashley, thank you for being here today. Um, uh, with a lot of student panels, especially um, folks, uh, students who are talking to us from the state level, I'm kind of starting to hone in on a question that I would love for you to help me answer. Um, so school boards are, are odd creatures in that when we gather and create a quorum, all of these laws kick in, uh, open public meeting laws and records laws, and, and we have to be available to be observed. And so that can have a cooling effect when you're trying to have an authentic and meaningful conversation with a group of students. Um, and our school board meetings really are meetings where the board is doing its work in front of the public. It's not really a two-way conversation. Um, so to like Diane's question earlier, how can we navigate, thread the needle of open public meeting laws where we're required to notice it and invite the public to observe and have authentic, meaningful conversations with students where those students who aren't typically involved in these conversations are able to come, where we do have that mind for equity and inclusionary practices and all that. So we're really hearing diversity. Um, and you don't have to answer that right now, but like, I'm wondering if maybe we as an association of school directors need to do more education for our students as to 
kind of how we're squeezed into this box of how we can interact with the public and how we can collectively solve for that and have those meaningful conversations. I'm pretty sure everyone here wants to have those conversations with students. We're just not sure how to legally do it. Any reflections uh, from anyone on that question or thought? Uh, Michelle, did you wanna speak to that? So you're talking me, Michelle, right? Yes, Michelle Perry, yes. Okay, so um, a couple of things. So uh, to kind of respond to Brian's comment. So Brian, we run into that. So when we have annual conference, national conference, regional meetings, we technically have to advertise that saying that our board's gonna to be together, that you're having a quorum. Um, that doesn't mean the publish, public always comes. So you could easily have a breakfast or a luncheon, as long as you're advertising it and saying, hey, we're gonna have a quorum. No action is being taken, but we are gonna have a quorum of board members here at this event. You can meet. You just have to let the public know. So you have to notify the public. You have to let them know, you know, you can let them know that there's no action going to be taken. It's an informal um, meet and greet with your school board or a breakfast with your school board or whatever. So you can do those things. You just have to follow the open public meeting guidelines and you can still have authentic conversations with people because um, not the public isn't all going to go. They're not going to be like, oh my gosh, look, they're all going to be there. We're going to go bombard them. That, that doesn't normally happen. I mean, in this day and age, it might because we do have some extremists out there right now, but I don't think you're gonna find that happening. And then I think by us opening the door to the community, to our students, especially, I think opening those doors to our students is huge because we do not get enough um, feedback from our students. We don't go to our students asking for enough, for enough stuff as a school board. Um, student import, uh, input should be, one of the most valuable things we ever use and we don't use it enough so i don't think we could should ever let public meeting laws um stop us from communicating with the people that we represent especially our students thank you michelle uh sarah but now do you have a comment question your hands up i had a separate question from brian so if others want to respond to brian please go ahead to me I don't see anything in the chat. Ashley, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, yeah, just super quickly. Um, I think part of it is also like not, not expecting people to show up um, to school board meetings, but realizing that there are a lot of opportunities for school board members um, to kind of learn about and empathize with student perspectives in different ways, right? So. Maybe it's not like at a school board meeting, but maybe like a couple people go um, to visit students like in their classrooms or like at lunch or like at the school. And and a lot of it is just having conversations that don't need to be on the record, right? But um, just as a way for adults to be able to actually understand and empathize with student perspectives and then be able to bring those back into like your open public decision making, right? Um, like it's even powerful to like be able to like collect like student quotes or like student stories or find like find a way to um to bring student voice into these spaces in in other ways um so i think like it is a challenge um to kind of work within that framework but um i think like i think there are a lot of ways to be like kind of be creative within this framework thank you ashley all good points i saw i saw a lot of head nodding on that one and even some hearts. Uh, so I think we have time for one more question. Sarah, why don't you go ahead and uh, and ask it and we'll we'll close out with uh, that thought. Great, thanks. Um, thank you, Ashley, so much for joining us and everything you're sharing. Your um, sharing inspired a new thought for me. So this is gonna be an ill-formed question, spoiler, um, that, one of the things we've been talking about in our district is how um, one of the aspects of graduating our students ready for whatever is next is graduating whole students, um, ensuring that our students graduate whole. And so 
the new thought that's occurring to me is around mental health and self wellness and because you were talking about like the other things that students want to include in mastery based learning around like I want to know how to like apply for an apartment and I want to know how to like do all these other things that aren't typically you know listed in the standards. Um, and so that thought arose to me of what is that intersection of self wellness health wellness um, and what opportunity we have to consider that as part of mastery um, in what we're devising here. I'd love your thoughts. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, I think it's really interesting that when you look at like kind of like the qualities and like the profile of a graduate, um, they aren't necessarily like technical skills, right? Or like skills that we'd expect people to like prove on a test. Oh, like, I mean, like a lot of it is like social emotional skills, things like, you know, being like being able to make decisions, like having self-awareness. Um, and yeah, and kind of a lot of things that you're talking about. Um, and like, I do think that when, um, when we trust students to kind of make decisions over their learning, um, kind of they like young people are um, are kind of empowered to um, take ownership of not just their learning, right, but also um, like how like how they show up in the world and and kind of their mental and emotional health. Um, so I don't know, like that's like that's a really like exciting conversation to think about um, and like. I'd love to reflect more on that, but I um, like I definitely feel like when I think back to my mastery based learning experiences um, or like experiences where I was trusted to kind of identify what I want to learn, um, decide how to learn it um, and actually, you know, feel like I had agency over kind of the future of like my learning, but also kind of just agency in my life and like more agency in my life more broadly. Um, that felt really good. And like, it's hard to explain, but like even that feeling of just like feeling like school was aligned with my interests and my passions, like I'm sure like made me like, emotionally and mentally healthier it's like i don't know like if there's like a scientific way to explain that but um yeah but i like i just feel like some of my like happiest moments in school have like has been in spaces where like i felt like i was like fully seen as a student and that um yeah and that people trusted me to like to, to take ownership over my learning I love closing this session on those remarks. Uh, what I heard you say, Ashley, is mastery-based learning when done well and authentically meeting students where they are really is uh, providing mental health supports and well-being for students. They're, they're, they're synonymous in some ways. They're, they're working in tandem together. So beautifully uh, said, great question, Sarah. And I think with that, uh, we're gonna close things out. What a robust 90 minutes. We lost some folks along the way, but thank you all for staying for the duration. Got a lot of great information, a lot of great questions. And I think we know mastery-based learning is a part of our present and our future. So uh, thanks for your investment in this time. And we look forward to the next one.